So, hey and welcome back everyone. It looks like the stream is finally working now. Uh, sorry for the delay. So I got some weird errors on Twitch here. Um, anyway, so let's dive right in. And uh, let's first recap a bit uh, what we talked about last time when I brought you some news. So I told you that um, in the previous week, uh, that's why we didn't have a stream then, uh, there was the open source homework conference happening in Gothenburg in Sweden. And I also attended that conference, which was really full of excellent and really, really great talks uh, from many, many people in the open source homework communities. Should I say not just community because it's like there are many, many different communities actually coming together uh, at that conference, uh, just like at many others, right? So there is uh, one uh, big community where uh, we have, you know, a Slack team uh, where many people meet, but we are sort of uh, so many projects that actually we, we have a bunch more. So for example, Uboot has its own uh, community or even communities, I could say. Uh, I'm not even sure because I'm not very much involved there. Uh, they have their own channels. Uh, the Coreboot community has their own Discord, for example, on the other hand. So as you can see, we are uh, very much distributed all around. Uh, and the UFI forum, for example, they also have their own platforms again. Um, and today I actually watched uh, one of their events, which was on Software Bill of Materials, uh, which is a very, very interesting topic in the uh, landscape of firmware because of the many, many different suppliers that we have there, uh, not just uh, regarding the firmware itself, but also the hardware behind that. Anyway, so um, let's look a bit uh, uh, at the conference and this time here, uh, let's actually have a closer look at the schedule. Now we'll just uh, quickly walk through and you know tell you some of the highlights that we had there. So uh, first up here, um, I mean, after <laughs> registration and breakfast, uh, we had a, a little opening. So essentially uh, the hosts were welcoming us. Um, there was a first talk on uh, open firmware, which is uh, regarding infrastructure. So if you're running, uh, let's say, server infrastructure with like, I don't know, 40,000, 50,000 servers, um, that is already quite a number, right? And But that's still in the realm of actually a small team managing all of that through software remotely. And if you are just a very small team and you need to manage a lot of servers, that means you also need to have a good robustness in the firmware itself, which is essentially what you use for management, right? So um, yeah, this is now talking about not only for hyperscalers, so hyperscalers are the likes of, um, you know, uh, like Facebook or ByteDance, well, not Facebook, no, it's Meta, Facebook being one of their products, but you won't know what I mean, right? Google or Alphabet, and you know, those very, very few actually, but they have like giant amounts of servers. Uh, but there are many, many uh, enterprises which also have lots of servers, not like such a high number as Meta or Google have. I, I can't even tell you the numbers because I don't know them myself. Um, but you know, when we talk about some tens of thousands or some hundred thousands, uh, that, that's still something that smaller <laughs> Uh, players uh, in, in that uh, field actually uh, do have. So yeah, that was a very, very interesting talk here. Um, essentially, uh, that was also a sort of a theme uh, around the day. Uh, we're very much uh, in a way demanding uh, from hardware suppliers that we actually do gain control over the hardware because in many, many cases, everything is actually closed source. And that means that when there are issues in the firmware, like we need a feature, for example, if something isn't working, which isn't like uh, super crucial, like it, you know, in, in a security manner, um, then they usually act uh, more responsively and you know rather quick. Um, but if it's something that you know just one of their uh, users actually needs, uh, then usually you know they prioritize that a bit down in their backlog. And because it's closed source, it means we cannot supply the features that we need ourselves. So yeah, that's why we actually demand full openness so that we can also help ourselves, right? So otherwise um, the vendor who is making the hardware is essentially a bottleneck to us. Well, um, and then on the other hand, uh, we, we had this talk here, um, which, which is a bit of a different topic again here, uh, VBE, Verified Boot for Embedded. Um, 
That is now coming from Simon Glass, who is very much involved in the U-Boot project. And VBE actually itself is a feature uh, being discussed in U-Boot, but the idea can also uh, you know, apply to other places. Um, it's part of the uh, verification of the boot process. Um, yeah, that was a very, very decent introduction actually, and also explained a bit the handover uh, that you would need to have between you know, the different stages in Fomer. Um, then we had a very, very interesting one, uh, the Tilitis key. That is a new product from, well, a new company named Tilitis. And if you know this name here, Frederik Stromberg, uh, he is the founder of the VPN provider Mulvat. Uh, together with a few other people he presented here. And now they made something um, which you can regard a uh, security hardware token. So um, that one here is, is a bit special because it's uh, based on an FPGA. And they gave out uh, samples for developers uh, to each of the conference attendees. So I also got one of those. Uh, it's that one right here. Um, to you, it now just looks like a regular USB stick, of course. Uh, but there is an ICE40 FPGA in there. Uh, ICE being, you know, from Lettuce, the semiconductor company. And then there is a corresponding uh, very, very neat hardware tool to program and uh, I think also debug the device, which is this one here, based on an RP2040. So yeah, if you recognize this here, uh, it's the uh, very, very small Raspberry Pi uh, ARM-based uh, controller, which also has like, you know, this uh, special programmable I.O. thing. Um, yeah, I haven't actually played uh, with that thing yet. Um, so yeah, it's uh, somehow on my agenda. Actually, it's a bit of a coincidence because I wanted to look into FPGAs anyway. And why am I mentioning this even uh, here so much? Because um, with this FPGA, uh, there is very, very good open tooling on the one hand side. And on the other hand, people have actually made RISC-V cores, uh, which you can just uh, put right into them. Um, and th then some other people also, uh, you know, they made full SLC. So, you know, when you have a, a processor core, uh, that by itself can only do the computations, right? And, you, you know, you get the basic instruction set. Um, but if you want to have preference, like a UART, for example, to get serial output, well, what we use uh, very, uh, very often here, uh, or you need something like SPI and so on, or even Ethernet at some point, um, then you would also need to have that in there. And that is called, well, besides the, the core that makes it a larger thing, a platform, it's called an SOC, a system on a chip. So yeah, I also got um, two other boards, uh, which I can use for that, uh, with, which is the orange crab board in, uh, well, two different shapes. So there is one which is a bit smaller, one which is a bit larger, uh, not in the form factor, um, but uh, you know, in terms of uh, its capacity of what you can put in there. So in FPGAs, there is something called lookup tables and the size or you know, the number of lookup tables you can put in there uh, together with uh, some other parameters basically determines like, um, you know, how, how far you can go, how much you can put in, uh, in there. It's a bit like, you know, the capacity of a USB storage, let's say. Um, you know, not, not really technically, but uh, in a figurative manner. So yeah, um, that is very interesting. Let's actually have a look at their website. So uh, if you also want to check this out, it's tilitis.se, SE for Sweden, because they are based in Sweden. Um, yeah, so this here is the device. I don't know if you can read this, um, but it does say ICE40 here. And this here is the logo of Lattice. So uh, yeah, as you can see, it is a Lattice and there is the L here in the logo, right? So yeah, it's uh, turned around a bit, but whatever. So yeah, it's, um, it's fully open and that means you can find everything on GitHub actually. So you find the schematics, the PCB design and the FB FPGA design. And well, you can then just use the open tooling um, to make your own Tilitis key uh, based on those FPGA sources. Now, this is also uh, what I talked about here a bit um, on this channel, and we will come to that also again in, in a bit, uh, because we also want to have open platforms, right? So that we can actually supply our own firmware um, and essentially, you know, implement all the features that we need in the firmware. So we do not depend on what the vendor does, or, you know, usually you don't even have contact to the firmware vendors. Um, 
or you can can't really demand any features right uh, like you know if you're a regular consumer uh, that is usually not an option so yeah this year is much much nicer so yeah big kudos and props uh, not trying to advertise too much here um, but you know if you want to uh, look for something to actually develop firmware on then you know these are things you actually need to watch out for right if something is just sold as open source um, that doesn't really mean anything you need to verify those claims right so if you see hey they just say open source uh, but all they do is they give you like a Linux kernel uh, but that's it you know they don't have documentation of their platform then it's actually not really open source so you, you have some sources but they are very limited in what they implement right and it's not like an open platform as you need it so yeah uh, next talk before the lunch break was then also a very very nice one the thing around your firmware or well, your system firmware maybe let me zoom in a bit actually so you can read better so yeah that one was also very very nice um, also very important for decision makers so if you uh, watch that talk or uh, you can watch the recording later um, watch out for uh, the graphs that they are showing and the numbers so you know over time um, there were also some uh, changes in, in terms of what uh, different uh, hardware uh, or firmware suppliers were actually doing, like, you know, the number of things which were open or not, or let's say the, the fraction. Yeah, um, yeah. the next talk, uh, also very interesting. That one is now coming from uh, Jordan Hand, uh, who is at Google. And uh, this year was on TPM commands and TPMs, Trusted Platform Modules, are very often dedicated hardware components. So that means if you have them on a, on a board somewhere, usually they're you know, just pluggable. Um, that means you actually have the wires or the traces somewhere exposed. So if uh, you, know, you don't have direct access to your hardware yourself because you're operating it remotely, it's somewhere in a data center, but there are other people in that data center you know, who go in, who go out. Um, the question is, do you really want to uh, trust them that they don't do malicious things to your hardware or you know do you just want them to uh, be completely unable to actually tamper with anything uh, because that is realistically speaking a case that can totally happen right especially in uh, let's say uh, in a co-located environment where you know many many different people bring the servers together um, it's even more uh, crucial actually because um, you know just because of the uh, number of participants in that infrastructure it's it's even harder to control for everyone anyway um yeah also a very very nice uh, talk speaking uh from different perspectives on the platform so yeah active interposes uh, that's the theme here the question is you know what are the different hardware attack scenarios what can you do against that um like you know for example not starting actually with the tpm being your first trust anchor but actually having the trust anchor on the chip itself uh, that boots the host system and then starting from there and, uh, you know, verifying that the TPM you're talking to is actually okay. Um, and well, just establish a secret uh, or um, at least secure connection in the beginning, right? So yeah, authentication definitely is key here. Um, yeah, the next one was on the firmware uh, bleed uh, vulnerability. You might have seen that, uh, you know, in the news around firmware, uh, there has been a lot in terms of vulnerabilities, actually. Uh, so that's because Alex Matrosov, who uh, founded the company Binarly, um, they are going around and checking on, you know, uh, essentially all the firmware that is now running on different uh, hardware devices. So yeah, uh, this is their website also, go check that out. They also have a bunch on, on GitHub, if that's interesting to you, uh, which I also sometimes look at or, uh, you know, in, in some related uh, shape work with. Um, and they actually, uh, you know, publish their advisory. So yeah, this year is uh, currently, um, you know, uh, it looks a bit alarming. Uh, this is essentially telling us um, the number of, uh, you know, different uh, classes of vulnerabilities uh, found in uh, firmware platforms. And this year is actually the uh, most horrible one. So, yeah, uh, this, this is a bit special now to the x86 architecture, so not too relevant uh, for us right now because we're uh, dealing with the RS-V architecture at the moment. Um, but regardless, we, we also have something similar, actually. So if you look at the uh, SBI, the 
uh, supervisor binary interface that we have to deal with. Um, it's similar to this, and this is the system management mode, which is a special mode in the uh, processor on x86, similar to the machine mode that we have in RISC-V. And then there would be uh, handlers for you know, calling uh, into this interface, uh, which are then executing code. And if you, uh, you know, have these very, very high privileges uh, somewhere in your hardware, um, this is what is out of sight to your operating system. So when uh, there is something executed in that context, it means the entire platform would freeze. Your operating system doesn't even run anymore. And then some other code is being executed. And then your operating system would return back. So you can imagine, you know, you know if you're uh, implementing this now in firmware, um, the problem is you need to be very performant, right? So essentially, don't actually put much code or uh, even better, not any code in there. Um, yeah, it's it's been uh, quite some history around that. If you want to read up on that, um, yeah, just go look at this website here. It's the advisories, binary IO search advisories. Um, yeah, and uh, there are usually, uh, you know, quite elaborative notes. And uh, what they're using here is a tool they call EFI Explorer, uh, which is what they also put on GitHub, uh, you know, which plugs into IDA Pro, uh, which is a very, very nice tool for investigating binaries. Yeah, definitely go check this out. Anyway, um, the next one here was uh, here, that one. Uh, by Brian Cantrell, who founded the uh, Oxide uh, computer company together with a few other people, including, uh, uh, I'm not sure if she's also a founder, but Jessie Frazell is also working there, uh, whom you might know from Docker because she did a lot of work around that. Um, yeah, and together with uh, many, many other, also actually well-known people, uh, they're implementing their own firmware in Rust for AMD-based platforms um, to supply uh, companies with servers that you you know can just run uh, on your own premise um, and what they are uh, pushing for is a holistic system so yeah what, what does holistic mean here really uh, it means that you actually do look at the platform at its entirety and you know you just define everything to be one thing not like okay there is some firmware here from some vendor there is some whatever operating system we took from somewhere else and then we put our own application on top of that that is absolutely not their approach, but their approach is to say, okay, this is the hardware and we control all of the software that we put on there from the beginning. Um, yeah, very, very interesting talk, definitely also. Um, yeah, also don't want to advertise too much again, um, but yeah, anyway. Um, next up is the UFI bootloader for KXacking Windows, which is uh, also something that we've been discussing quite a bunch in the open source firmware community. So if you can uh, imagine, you know, if you want to KXac a Windows kernel, so KXac actually wants to have ELF binaries, uh, that doesn't really work because Windows uses the PE32 format, uh, which is also what UFI uses. So it's a different binary format. Um, Essentially, that just means you need a different parser or loader, if you will. Uh, so yeah, that technically works, but Windows also relies on UEFI. So that means it cannot stand on its own without some UEFI services being present. So yeah, this year um, is then hooking into an existing uh, UEFI. Um, and now the last one for the day uh, by uh, Ron Minnick, who actually founded the Coreboot project, um, which is what we forked Orboot from, right? Uh, uh, he actually started that, so the first uh, the first commit changing uh, from core boot to Orboot was to remove all the C code. Uh, this here is now on uh, the Min Platform transition. So Min Platform is a project from Intel um, to supply, you know, uh, people who want to write their own firmware uh, with some more reduced binary. So usually they, you know, would uh, give you like something really huge. And this here is something a bit smaller. And now they made this min platform thing um, with a whole framework around that. And essentially, it's very much uh, similar to core boot, but it's written in a, in a different style. So it's more like in the Windows or UFI code base style, um, which means, yeah, it's, it's actually not very useful uh, to us in the open source firmware communities uh, because, you know, we're, we're following some uh, different mindsets. 
So yeah, um, and also the problem was uh, that you know by design, that wasn't really uh, tailored for uh, being an actual open source uh, project because, and that's also a part of this here uh, being uh, called a case study. Um, what we actually need is to also have open development, right? So we need open platforms. We need to be able to collaborate on those platforms. And yeah, that, um, well, that was the outcome of evaluating this year uh, when, you know, hyperscalers looked at that and said, well, um, we actually, we actually want, we really want to have Coreboot because this is a collaborative project that we work on and yeah. So yeah, that was day one. Um, day two was a bit uh, shorter, uh, starting with a talk from HPE. So HPE Enterprise, you know, HP maybe from making printers or also some laptops. And they're also very, very much in the server supply market uh, with HP Enterprise. And uh, Jean-Marie Vallard, uh, who uh, joined Open uh, the uh, HPE company at some point, um, is uh, very, very much engaged and uh, pushing the open source firmware projects uh, really hard on their side. Uh, and they are now offering, uh, you know, the first uh, companies uh, to be able to actually use open source tooling on their platforms, which includes Linux boot on the one hand side. So for the host CPU uh, that you have a Linux kernel in your flash already, so you can define your own boot environment with that. And on the other hand, open BMC, so you can also control the management controller that sits on the servers, you know, fully from your own side. Now, the next one was also a bit related to BMCs, uh, not just a bit, but very much. Uh, the UBMC project, uh, which is similar to OpenBMC. It's just, um, let's say, a different userland, <laughs> essentially. Uh, so, yeah, UBMC has tooling written in Go, and it's also based on the Euro project, uh, just like, you know, um, the userland that we also talked a bit about here. Um, yeah, using also some, uh, you know, some slightly uh, different protocols in some manners, like, uh, for example, in, in the Go world, there is um, something called protobuf, uh, you know, for, uh, for serializing data. Uh, and then there is uh, some, some exchange protocol. So yeah, and unlike uh, OpenBMC, which is mostly looking at, uh, you know, more like legacy, like REST-based uh, APIs, if you, know, if you know web development, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, this one here is uh, much, much more modern and also trying to be more uh, rather simple and robust uh, instead of being, you know, very, very extensive. Um, so yeah. Uh, I hope, I hope we will see more in that direction, actually, also from uh, larger suppliers. Um, now, the next one was, uh, I actually skipped those two here, uh, so I'm, I can't tell too much about that, but they are both around core boot, one around performance measurement, one around uh, ACPI tables, which can also be a very interesting uh, thing. So on the uh, RISC-V platform here, uh, we're currently using device trees, but as you know, in previous streams, I also talked about ACPI and some people trying to, uh, you know, push the uh, UFI legacy approaches also, you know, for compatibility to the RISC-V platform. Um, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> we would actually want to innovate. Anyway, uh, trying to stick with this here. If you are already in this ecosystem and, you know, you're working uh, already with ACPI tables, um, then, you know, doing uh, this generation here um, is also a very, very interesting thing to look at. Yeah, definitely also go go check out those recordings here because they can also teach you very, very much, uh, you know, around firmware development from some different perspectives than uh, what, what I can offer here right now. So, yeah, um, that was uh, almost the end. So there were two more talks about Corbett. So one was the uh, different approaches. Uh, to adding new firmware, uh, to adding new SOCs to uh, firmware. So, you know, when you have a new SOC, the question is, how do you start? So, what well, we, we did here now, uh, just recently for the um, for the Vision 5.1, when we started over, uh, we actually copied a bunch of files, right? So, that is one approach. Uh, then you could technically also use something like scaffolding tools and so on. And yeah, this year is about doing the same thing essentially for uh, Core Boot. And now that next one here uh, was about modern Intel platforms, so uh, Intel desktop platforms especially. Um, and yeah, here uh, they also had a bit of a challenge, you know, with the different uh, hardware components. Uh, also very, very exciting to look at. Uh, 
Um, yeah, Michal Zagowski and Michal Kopetz, they are from uh, a company in, in Poland called 3MDEP, uh, also making a bunch of open hardware actually, which is really, really cool. Um, yeah, and they also work a, a lot uh, for uh, different uh, companies uh, that run core boot on their systems. Okay, and the last one here uh, was on, on Sigsum, and Sigsum is a so-called transparency lock. So the idea is to have something which is uh, in, in its essence the same idea as uh, what we do on the web. So on the web, you know, we have these um, different certificates on websites, like, you know, on, on top here, for example, you can see this uh, padlock icon and then you get some more information if you look uh, deeper into it, connection is secure. Uh, you can look at the certificate actually, you know, and now the question is, where did the certificate come from? Who signed the certificate and so on? And well, we also have a lot of certificate infrastructure and firmware to actually verify the contents of the firmware. And yeah, that's what Sigsum is about. So the idea is to have transparency logs similar to what we do on the web. If you don't know the concept of transparency logs, then definitely this is a very good talk. Uh, otherwise, um, yeah. Uh, also go check out the Sigsum website. So I, th I think it's sigsum.org. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, brings transparency to sign checksums. Yeah. So yeah, definitely, definitely have a look at that. All right, and with that, we're coming to the last day, which was Wednesday last week, which is why we didn't have the stream then. Um, first talk, uh, again on TPMs, but this time for remote association. So the idea here is using Bluetooth, actually, to verify that your laptop is in a healthy state. So there will would be an app on your phone, which is paired to your laptop. And then when you open the laptop and you start it, it would actually connect to the phone over Bluetooth and give a proof that its health state is okay. So there is a bit of an exchange protocol and then you can see as a consumer, you know, that your laptop hasn't been tampered with. So if you need to unlock your hard drive then, you can verify that it's actually okay now to enter your password and it's not like, you know, there is something set up to sniff your password and give it somewhere else and, you know, somebody gets your data. You don't want that. And you also don't want to have malware or, or something, right? Yeah, next one um, on uh, Linux boot uh, now. Uh, this one here is on KXEC evolution. So yeah, we, we just talked a bit about KXEC in Windows, uh, but yeah, this here is a bit in a different direction. So yeah, there are also some things to consider like stability across different kernel versions, for example, and things like that. Um, now, if you look at this here, it's, it's all a bit short. So these are all the lightning talks, 15 minutes each. Okay, so next up, uh, runtime configuration for Core Boot. So uh, I also, uh, I think I also showed this here in the stream at some point. Uh, I intend to have a boot utility, I call it T-Boot for now, uh, which gives you a bit of a menu for booting things up. Um, and at the same time, you would also, you know, have to actually, uh, you, you also want to have a configuration interface, right? So um, people are very much used to that when they boot up their computer, they can press some hotkeys and then, you know, go in some settings and make a few changes. Um, like, for example, the default boot device or, you know, disabling or enabling some boot devices and so on, maybe network boot or something like that. So, yeah, um, they are also uh, highlighting something here, um, doing uh, something like that for core root. Uh, this one here is also very interesting uh, from a payload handoff design. So, you know, when uh, you have your different stages in firmware or different components to call into, let's say you have a supplier that doesn't actually want to open up their components. So instead they give you binaries and header files. Now you need to still exchange some information and you need to have a contract and so on. So yeah, the question is, how do you design that? Um, uh, yeah, that was very interesting as well. Um, I actually haven't followed that one too much. So definitely go check that out. I will also have to look at the recording again. Um, yeah, now the uh, next one, uh, yeah, <laughs> you see my name here. Uh, that one was on uh, SBOM annotations and audits. Uh, there is, sorry, a comma missing here. So you know, I also have the uh, Fjetka project. Uh, we can actually have a quick look at the website also. So Fjetka is an app uh, that you can use to load a firmware image and then you can look at its content. So, you know, you will get a view like this one here. So you will get a list of all the components. Uh, and in fact, this here is a bit of an older screenshot. I should update that at some point. 
Uh, but anyway, you, you know, you, you see the different names of the components if they are available. Um, and, you know, there is many, many uh, options here to also edit firmware and so on. Now, the question is, you know, if you have binary components in the firmware, uh, you know, how can you actually check uh, what exactly is in there and so on. So that's what I talked about here. Um, and now the idea is that you can also make annotations like in Ghidra, for example, another tool to investigate binary files. Uh, so, you know, um, I'm adding features so that you can, you know, just drop some notes in there. You can save them, uh, you know, put them on GitHub and exchange with other people. So you can see, hey, uh, we have the same binary component in our firmware. Uh, what do you think this is? And so on. So I, I don't really intend to run infrastructure for that. So, yeah, I, I will see a bit how that works out. Maybe companies are interested in, you know, doing that on their own premise. So, you know, I wouldn't even see it actually. Uh, but that's totally fine. So the license of Yetka is uh, the MIT license. So, you know, you're, you're allowed to just run your own uh, modified copies of that and so on. And I mean, in, in terms of data, I cannot dictate anything anyway, right? <laughs> data is everyone's own data. Now, this talk here was actually uh, replaced. So this, uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, that talk had to be canceled. I don't know uh, if the speaker couldn't make it or something. Um, so in, instead, we had something uh, given by uh, Jonathan Neuschäfer on a um, little uh, satellite TV box that, uh, you know, uh, he worked with, um, where he uh, just reverse engineered the platform, essentially, and he showed us a bit the process of how he did that, uh, how he figured out how the frame buffer works, and so on. And he actually gave the presentation on that satellite TV box itself, because he figured out how it works, right? So he... Uh, actually wrote the presentation as a small app in a sense. Um, well, and then the last one, uh, yeah, by me again. Um, I prepared those slides a bit w in exchange with Ron, uh, who gave me some feedback. So I gave a status report on the Orbit project, which is what we are mainly talking about here, and that will lead us uh, back to our stream again here. So yeah, I talked a bit about, you know, how we just reworked uh, the whole repository, how we dropped a bunch of things. Um, switched to the uh, Rust embedded HAL model for the drivers and so on. And I was actually running that presentation on the all winner D1 SOC actually, um, you know, because we also uh, got that one completely up and running. And thanks to very, very big thanks. I also mentioned that in the talks, but very, very big thanks to Samuel Holland, who, who actually ported the, or, or um, uh, pushed the uh, sources for uh, Linux to upstream. Uh, well, it, not everything is merged yet, uh, but yeah, he, he took very, very great care of that. And that's why we have very good support uh, for the D1 SLC. So yeah, uh, definitely go check out the recordings. I can't tell you when they will be available because I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. maybe during the next weeks, we will see. And with that, and with uh, what I also just mentioned in mind, uh, uh, around uh, you know open platforms and so on uh, let us look at this here very briefly so uh, you know we're working on this uh, platform which is called the vision 5 one so the first vision 5 from uh, star 5 and star 5 made an soc the seven uh, the sorry the jh7100 uh, as written here and the jh7100 unfortunately it doesn't have full documentation right so we were al already struggling with that a bit, and I um, put something on that here in this uh, in this other thread, and now you know I um, started a new summary again. So yeah, there is a bunch of things here. Um, I don't want to read this all up right now, so you can also read this yourself uh, if you go to this Google group here. Uh, it's uh, risk5.org, and then here it's the Dev Board community. I think it should be uh, free for everyone to just join or sign up or something. But we can actually see if this URL here works if you are in a new browser. Right, yeah, that works, okay. Uh, which is actually a very good verification because I also put that uh, usually in the notes um, with the video recordings. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah, I, I dropped everything that we could figure out so far and I found a tool which uh, comes from sci five actually. sci five who made the processor core, uh, the um, FU74 that we're using, or uh, U74, or maybe U74 is something else. 
Um, it, it, it's still confusing to me, to be honest. Uh, and this tool here is an SVD generator and the uh, SVD here, so it's like you know, uh, a file describing the hardware, can be generated from a DTS file, so a device tree. But that means it's the reverse order, right? So usually we would want to have the SVD first, from there generate code, and then also derive a device tree from that. But if we only have a device tree right now, well, maybe in reverse order, we can also generate much of an SVD file, um, from which we can then, for example, generate Rust with SVD to Rust. Yeah, I tried out that tool, uh, ran into some errors and found an issue. Um, so yeah, we, we will see what we can figure out. So yeah, go check this, uh, check out this thread here. Anyway, uh, with that, let us actually come back to what we're doing here, which is porting Orboot to the Vision 5.1. So yeah, um, last time uh, where we left off was uh, where we already got output again from the board. And what happened was um, we were actually seeing some, some weird characters, right? So we had some trouble setting up the UART properly. And uh, yeah, that was giving, up a bit, uh, giving us a bit of a headache. Um, and I just remember now, so you, you recall I was having trouble here with uh, Twitch. So I don't actually see the chat right now here in OBS, uh, but I will see if I can get it on the Twitch platform itself. Oh, look, somebody actually joined. Uh, yeah, hello, Ben. Welcome, welcome to the channel. So yeah, um, I figured out also one, one tiny bit we were missing, and it's actually not just one bit, but it's actually uh, four bytes. And those four bytes are what would enable us to run on the uh, flash itself. And I want to show you that right now. Um, so yeah, if we uh, want to boot from flash, we need to write the size of what we have uh, to be loaded into SRAM. Uh, actually at the start of the binary. So yeah, I, uh, I already did this in preparation two weeks ago and I created, I think I created a small script and let's have a look at that. So let's go to the source main board, uh, star five vision five one directory and actually the BT zero directory. So this is the first stage that we're currently working on. So if you look at this here, uh, I created a small makefile. Let's look at the makefile very quickly. Um, it's not very extensive. As you can see, there is still like to do here. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, some inheritance. Uh, we, we still have this for uh, for the Orboot setup for the makefiles. It's something we will rework at some point, but so never mind right now. Um, the point is uh, actually somewhere here. Uh, do I have this? No, I actually don't. Anyway, so this here is just a few convenient scripts right now. Um, let's see. So yeah, this here is just triggering cargo release and then doing the opt copy. So this is what we uh, what we already had in the script. Oh, right, but look at this here. I also created this script. It's called flash.sh. Yeah, so flash.sh, what does flash.sh do? Well, it runs make. So make will run uh, this task here, the mainboard task that will make us a release build, do the opt copy. And now we take the release binary, which is the result of the opt copy. And then we echo something to its beginning. And this here, well, it's just an escape hex representation and we need to read it backwards because we're little endian, right? So we now use our favorite calculator again, Node.js. This here is OX, OO, so the last two zeros, OO. So essentially we're still at zero. And then comes 3F, F, C. And this is almost 16K, right? So it's 16380. Uh, so yeah, four more would be 6K. And those four bytes are the first, right? So now I'm saying that essentially the whole uh, first 16K should be loaded into SRAM uh, to start from. So yeah, this is uh, just by convention. So the, um, the Mascrom is demanding that you have this in the beginning for whatever reason, that's just how it works. 
So there is no like integrity measurement or anything right here. It's it's really just um, you can essentially just use this very high number and just you know load everything. Um, it it doesn't really matter if there is something uh, you know which you may need to zero out. You can still do that or something. Um, I'm I'm just loading everything into there. And uh, well, we're not even working. Um, we're not even working with anything like I don't know heap memory or something because we don't we don't actually need it here. Uh, we we can just get away with a bit of a stack and that's it. Um, actually, even if we do need a heap, uh, I mean, just uh, to be sure, we would uh, zero that out anyway. We don't want to rely on that being uh, zeroed uh, by you know the hardware on reset or something. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's it's just the most convenient hack that we can do. So what what I do here is um, I actually create a new file. Uh, I don't even need to do it that way. I can also do it a bit different, but yeah, whatever. Um, I create a new file. I call it x.bin. Uh, I create those, you know, first four bytes. Uh, this here just means that um, dash n, that there is no line break. So usually echo would give you a line break. Now it's without a line break. Uh, and then I just concatenate. So the cat command is for concatenation. Um, I concatenate the release binary into that file also. So yeah, now we have one thing and I call my convenience script, which is the JH7100 reflash. And then I flash the x.bin binary, uh, which means that I actually do have something in flash right now uh, that we can boot. So let's fire up two things. Uh, we're using picocom, right? For the one, uh, uh, for the one uh, USB serial adapter and the other one, is what we use minicom for and i hope i plug them in the right order so when i power on the board now we should actually see something happening yes and we do so yeah if you look at this it says orboot we get a crab uh it's reading something and then it continues to boot so yeah look at this now we are already in the uboot environment and um yeah what what i essentially uh, did was so uh let's scroll back a bit so if if you recall from the early streams uh we were setting a different uh command to use for uh reading from the spy flash for the mascrum so the mascrum actually uh you know uh it can already talk to the spy flash directly um if you if you tell the chip to uh, switch to a different read command and the read command is, you know, the very, very simple spy flash read command. It's just hex three. Um, let's uh, look at that in the source code here. So uh, in main.rs, uh, very much down here. Yeah, you, you see there is a, a few things remaining. Um, uh, this is... Uh, Right. So this is uh, where, uh, you know, we set up the serial. And, uh, well, as you can already see, uh, <laughs> I also uh, did a bit of uh, a preparation already. So uh, here I'm already uh, writing to the serial directly. This is not yet using a macro. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a formatted write to the serial. So what I want to do at some point is I want to implement something uh, you know, a, a, a macro that you can use with the uh, embedded hell crate. I couldn't yet fully get that to work here. I don't really know. I don't really know why. So as you can see, I tried a, a few weird options. So what I want to be able to do eventually is just say print LN or boot like this, right? Anyway, yeah, uh, this, this comment here is even obsolete because we already have the DRAM in it uh, that we j then just execute from flash. And, but let's actually look at uh, at the uh, spy flash in it, right? That's what we have here. So spy flash in it, uh, it's really just a very small function. It's not doing anything but just writing to a register using MMIO, so queues by read CMD. Um, that is just uh, this year uh, plus that. Uh, so this year is a register which you can uh, define the read command to use in 
uh, where he's saying we're using the regular spy flash read command. You know, it's uh, this, not the fastest one, so this is really the slowest that you can use, but it works and we only need to load at maximum 16K. So yeah, it's totally fine to do this here. The hex three or, or just three, uh, same in, in decimal. Um, that's what we do here. And now after doing this, uh, we can actually use the memory mapped spy flash now because now the controller is also mapped to memory. And that's how we can now read from this address, which is where the spy flash is being mapped. And now if uh, you also recall that from earlier streams, um, we actually had this where, uh, you know, we had to, uh, we had to skip a few bytes somewhere. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, first let, let's zoom uh, or, or change the panes a bit here like this. Okay, now it's a bit more readable. So yeah, the thing I'm reading here is um, I'm reading a raw slice. And uh, this here says it's uh, it's 32 bytes in size, I guess. Um, or is it? I'm actually not sure right now. Uh, am I reading 32 slices? Oh, right. Yeah, no, no. Uh, this is how I'm reading 32 bytes. And then I'm just reflecting them here, right? So yeah, this is uh, what the uh, log here is. So yeah, I'm using write format, but never mind that. Um, so yeah, this is the raw number. And before that, I'm actually saying read from and the address here. So that's up here. And uh, well, now we actually need to load the DRAM blob. And yeah, here we have the same pattern again as uh, before for booting from flash. So in, in a similar fashion, um, we have to first, we have to first read the first four bytes. So that's a U32. Uh, and those four bytes determine the size of the DRAM blob. So that's what the vendor put in uh, firmware, right? So, or in, in the flash actually. So first, they have their uh, first stage, which we just replace with or boot. After that stage comes the DRAM blob. After the DRAM blob comes OpenSBI. And after OpenSBI finally comes U-boot. Um, so yeah, that, that whole stack we uh, talked about earlier in the uh, stream already uh, that we intend to replace. So now we're at uh, sort of having replaced the first stage. So yeah, um, as, as you can see, we're, we're now in U-boot here uh, after that. So what, what we do is after we loaded that into DRAM, uh, we just use this here, transmute and then execute. So yeah, th this F here is just the result of saying transmute. Um, yeah, we, we could also do this here a bit uh, different, but it doesn't really matter right now. Uh, yeah, anyway, if, if we were to, um, if we were to pass some information, like in, in this case here, uh, the first thing is the U size. So this here is uh, telling the heart ID. So, you know, the heart being the hardware thread or uh, core, if you will. Um, and the second thing would be the address of the device tree uh, just by convention. So these are uh, what is put in the argument register zero and one. So yeah, uh, we're executing from this address and passing those two in the argument registers. And well, that's uh, where the boot continues. So let's actually see where we are right now, because now that we have this uh, environment here, um, let's see if we can actually uh, use it. So I'm going to reset now because I don't know, it seems like it's hanging. I want to see if I can actually use or boot now or uh, not, not or boot, but you boot. Uh, if not, then we might actually need to comment out something that we uh, eagerly initialized, which is the um, the gigabit Ethernet here, the GMAC. Yeah, so maybe maybe we can just comment this out, and uh, then we can reflash. Oh wow, well, it uh, it's it's having some some trouble here. I don't know. I don't know what is going on there. Well, let's uh, let's reset again and see what happens. Yeah, otherwise I will, I will just copy out this uh, one line here or, or save it and so on. 
Well, it is actually trying to boot from Ethernet right now. Okay, so let's do the following. We already had this set up um, where we, uh, okay, I put it somewhere else. And in firmware risk five, risk five, risk five, something, uh, vision five. So I made this directory here called uh, TFTP home uh, with which I could now set up a uh, server. So uh, we were using uh, from Harvey OS, we were using a tool mm. uh, that was the, uh, what's it called? The sender tool, right? So yeah, uh, send. Sure, the thing is, uh, yeah, I need to write it this way. I need to give it the full path because I'm switching to a different user. Uh, anyway, so yeah, let's, uh, let's run this command and see if we can boot from here now. And let's just verify very quickly that the adapter is correctly recognized and set up. So we got this address here. That's what we're listening on. And let's see if we can boot from this address now. Oh, look, it's loading and we're going to be in Linux in a bit. Look at that. Oh, wow. So that means we can actually already boot fully through from Orboot now, right? So yeah, this is now booting up the uh, operating system and well, it's running into a stack trace. Uh, something, something Ethernet. So yeah, I guess, I guess I should save this here and actually do a refresh. So yeah, let's quickly do a refresh. Um, yeah, it's happening right now. Yeah, as you, uh, as you recall, um, currently we are only uh, flashing the first bits and how are we doing that again? So we uh, load some, some blob to DRAM that initializes the protocol again and then loads our next blob and writes that to the flash and well, then we can reset. So yeah, this is now transferring the first blob now it's transferring the second blob that will be written to DRAM uh, to to uh, to the spy flash, and we're done. And now we can reset, and now it should automatically get uh, fully into Linux actually. So yeah, our boot is already done, as you can see. It's really just this uh, tiny bit of uh, you know setting up a few registers. Uh, it says auto boot in two seconds, waiting for phi, loading, loading. Why do we see a star here? That should actually not be the case. I mean, huh? It already did something using TFTP, right? So some something isn't right here. I don't know. Maybe we actually do need those uh, changes that we already had. Um, maybe something wasn't reset properly, or we still need to implement something for a full platform reset. I don't know. Uh, I will just turn off the board again and turn it on. And let's see if we can boot through again. And I, I will actually see if uh, if something is happening on Twitch. Ah, nothing in the chat. All right. Um, this here is interesting. Max retry is reached. I think we saw this earlier. But we saw a bit more. I don't know. Yeah, it definitely looks like uh, something, something, something is still missing here. Well, but we do get uh, through the first stage, which is very, very promising. Oh, wow. Yeah, I will, I will just uh, uncomment this uh, change here again. Uh, reflash. Yeah, and uh, well, we, we talked quite a lot already today, so maybe I will actually finish the stream in a bit um, and then see that I prepared uh, prepare a bit more for next time. And what we then actually want to do is, uh, at some point, uh, we want to have the full X test set up, so that, you know that we don't need this uh, special script here. Um, but you know that's that's more like 
uh, a horizontal thing in terms of software uh, development strategy. Uh, well, a another thing we want is to actually write our own uh, our own SBI implementation. We will use the REST SBI library for that. And we also want to have our own DRAM init implementation. Um, so the current one is sort of fine, but it's like, you know, we're jumping into foreign code and then that code would need to jump into our code again. And well, I don't know. Now we actually still need to figure out uh, which uh, DRAM part we actually have on the hardware platform because um, you know, if, if you recall, maybe, uh, let me reset in the meantime. So on, on the board, we have uh, two DRAM parts, uh, four gigabytes each, so that we have eight in total. And yeah, the question is, uh, you know, what is their clock rate and so on? So in part, we can read that. Uh, yeah, that looks promising again. Yay, and we're uh, booting into Linux, nice. Um, yeah, the, the question is what are the exact DRAM parameters because in, in part we don't really have it uh, documented somewhere, uh, but there are different uh, implementations in the vendor's uh, source code. So yeah, I, I guess what we're seeing here is actually the issue that we were having with, um, with you know, different kernels and ethernet not working here, but working in another implementation and so on. Uh, yeah, let's actually look at that because it is something we, uh, right, we, we talked about this here. So yeah, M image, I will, um, I will use another kernel right now. So I will unlink this and instead, uh, I will link the vendor thing to M image. I will hit reset in the meantime. So yeah. Um, Oh, and I actually uh, found something in their Linux fork at some point, which I think is related to the Ethernet issues that we were, uh, no, uh, related to the KXAC issues that we were having. Uh, okay, now it's, well, it's not loading once again. I don't know why. I'll just hit reset again. Um, yeah, and, and that patch might actually be uh, that uh, issue that we were having with uh, kxec -ing. So the KXEC issue was like, uh, why is it not loading now? I don't know. It's it's weird. So I would just power off and power on again. Um, yeah. So the the KXEC issue that we were having was like it, I don't know, had some trouble with alignment or something. Um, yeah. It might be that we actually have an easy fix rate. Now this is super weird. Reading ec max rate tries reached. Something, something is wrong with the ethernet and I don't know what the issue is. Strange, really, really strange. Yeah. Let me check the cable. Maybe there is something wrong with the cable or something. I don't know. Shouldn't actually be. I just hit reset twice. <laughs> oh, well, uh, we do get our nice crab emoji. That's one thing. And it's stuck loading once again. Nope, doesn't even want to cancel. So let's Let's actually try the following. So I will just wait a bit when we're booted into uh, U-Boot. I will, I will hit return immediately or, or control C something. Uh, okay. And let's wait a bit. It says error IP adder not set. Okay. But in our boot command, we actually do that, right? So we, uh, we set this address here for ourselves. This is the server address and we're now loading a file called mimage. Oh, we're having the same issue again. I don't know, it's really strange. Actually, uh, maybe, maybe something, um, maybe something is actually being written to flash at some point. I don't know. 
because it worked once after refreshing, right? So I'm going to refresh now, then we boot again, and then we will see. So yeah, uh, in, in two stages again, number one, number two. Let's actually uh, restart the sender server because it was still trying to send something. Um, maybe that was also the actual issue and it was stuck doing something. I don't know. Could also be a bug in sender in a way. You never know um, with uh, so many components involved. So yeah, auto boot in two seconds, waiting for Phi. And no, we're having the same issue again. Huh. So the asterisk here um, actually means that it's uh, having some, some trouble loading something. So usually you would see hashes now for you know showing the progress, just like we saw before, but no, nothing. I would just try another uh, one or two resets. And well, if that doesn't work, uh, or well, either way, uh, we will have another look a bit at the source code. Now we'll walk you through uh, a few of the changes that I already did last time. Now this year is strange again too because now we're uh, we're not even in U-boot. I think I think this year is still like oh I, actually this is U-boot, but it's only partially coming up. I don't know why. Maybe there is also something wrong with U-boot. So yeah, this here is open SBI. Huh. Maybe U-boot doesn't like Orbit or something. You never know. <laughs> Just kidding here. But yeah, we will replace U-boot eventually anyway. So instead of U-boot, we will be using Linux boot. Nope, that doesn't want to work. Very, very, very unfortunate. Okay, one, one more try, one more try. I just did a, uh, another reset, which would, uh, you know, give you the math from prompt up here. And then did another reset. Okay, I, uh, I consider that a failure. So yeah, whatever. Uh, let's look at the code again. So. Uh, let's open this here in a new uh, in a new window or whatever it's called in Tmux. So yeah, here in the uh, source main, uh, this is now a few things that are already started. So you can see I already imported the embedded hell crate. So I'm saying use embedded hell, and what I'm implementing is the write command. Right. So the write command is what we use for the serial. Um, actually we're using write twice. So there is this write, uh, maybe that's actually not so, not so clever. So we're saying use right here and we're saying use right here. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I will, I will rethink that anyway. Um, so yeah, this year is just wrapping a bit because, uh, what we're doing is, um, we're initializing a serial here. And when we initialize the serial here, um, this is a modification of what we already did last time. So if we look at init.rs here, I made a few changes. And one of those changes is, so you, you recall this year, the uart init that we had and the uart write so instead of using these raw methods now, I'm using this here. I'm defining a struct which is called serial. And for serial, I'm um, uh, implementing the traits for embedded hell serial. So there is a few things that you need to do. Uh, one is the error. So, you know, when an error occurs, you would need to implement that. Uh, the other one is the uh, implementation of an init. Um, which I put in the constructor, right? So when you say new, uh, then you would do the uart init and you would return a reference to yourself. 
And now uh, the interesting part here, uh, the right function. The right function actually needs two things. So one is well, the, uh, this, this right thing here by itself. And the other thing is this uh, flush method. So um, here, here's how this works. So you can, uh, with the UART, uh, you can work with a small uh, buffer. So you, you can put a few bytes in this buffer actually, and then flush that buffer. So uh, this here, uh, TFE, it's not yet implemented. Um, I think it's like transmit uh, something something e empty. I, I actually forgot what it's short for. Um, we, we can also look that up in a bit. Anyway, this is um, something uh, yeah that would tell you if you can flush or something. Um, I don't know. I actually just copied that over from uh, from the other implementation for the all winner d one. Um, yeah, anyway, so yeah, let's maybe quickly look at the write function here. So we already had this here sort of last time, so we were writing. Um, I also reworked those functions here. So yeah, the, you need to know those registers. They're actually 8-bit registers, um, but uh, so that's one byte, uh, but they are 32 bits apart from each other for some reason. Um, I, I guess that is easier to implement in hardware, but I don't know. So yeah, this is why uh, you know we always just write eight bits. And there is one thing called the transmit holding register. Uh, this is where uh, you know we, we put our byte. And now there is something called LSR, the line status register. And on the line status register, uh, we just check uh, if it's um, if it's already empty. So if it's empty, you know, then then we can uh, put our byte in there, and it will be transmitted at some point. Uh, but if it's not empty, we actually wait for it. And that's what this here is uh, for. So NB, that is, uh, in, in this instance here, it's not non-binary, what you may uh, know it uh, being short for. Um, but this here is, uh, good question, actually. Uh, no, this here is uh, for non-blocking, I think. So yeah, there there is something, uh, the wood block error. So this here is now feedback to, um, to the uh, wrapping embedded help uh, thing here. So you, you see they also just wrap NB here. Um, so th this here is sort of, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm importing that actually from here. Uh, I, I think this here is actually just re-exporting things. Anyway, yeah, so wood block means, um, you know, at, at this instance here, um, the transmit holding register is not yet ready. It still needs to send something and so this bit here, line says register, transmit, hold, register, empty. Empty isn't set. So um, that's that part. Now we had the, uh, if you look at the sources for uh, the D1 SOC, we implemented this here. And what this here is, is another wrapper again. And this is now defining macro. So there is one print line macro, there is one print macro, and there is this thing here, uh, the internal print. And this needs to be, um, you know, th this needs to be an operation uh, that you cannot interfere with. And that is what we're using something for called a lock. So a lock here. Uh, let's see where we're uh, putting this from. Right. So there is this here called mutex and this here called once uh, from the spin crate. So, you know, there, there are different kinds of locks. Uh, one, one type of lock is the so-called spin lock. Um, there, there are a few others. Uh, what it allows uh, for doing is that, you know, if, um, if multiple uh, parts of, uh, of our code are trying to now uh, write to the UART, you know, they, they shouldn't try to, you know, just blindly do that in sort of parallel. Um, but it should actually be that, you know, it's very consistent and only one thing at a time actually get it, gets its turn. So that's what we're uh, using a lock for. And it looks like, because I couldn't fully get this to work yet, 
um, if I actually uh, use this here as it currently is, uh, then the hardware would actually lock up in a way, which, which sounds a bit odd because it's sort of what it should do, but no, it should actually just be uh, blocking for, for a few things. So yeah, I, um, you know, for debugging, I just started doing this here and that here, uh, but we're never getting there. So yeah, I'm, I'm writing just an L character here. And then when I'm doing this here, uh, this is also what we do on the D1, I think. Um, now the next statements are actually no longer being called. So yeah, we never actually see this output, uh, which is a bit strange. So yeah, something that we still need to figure out. Um, and this year, well, uh, I don't know, there, uh, there are a few different methods that you can call. I think this um, logger, so logger is, is uh, you know, is using this once thing here. Um, so, you know, you only get one instance of it, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not fully working yet. Yeah, maybe, maybe we need to do something a bit different or something. Or maybe we need to enable something in the platform so that we can use it. That could also be the case. Yeah. Yeah, I put a comment also here that it's essentially just copied over from uh, from the Sunji Nurja implementation. So we can actually look at the diff between that one and the Nurja BT0 source logging. And you see it's, well, I, I put uh, a few other things in there. Oh, sorry, not, not the main.rs, but the log.rs. Yeah, it's, it's almost the same thing. It's just that the naming is a bit different. So instead of logging, I just call it log. Uh, and then here, well, I, I try to debug this, but otherwise it's, it's the same as, uh, as this year. So it's saying call once uh, here. Yeah, yeah, this is the other method. So the one I'm trying here because, you know, I tried uh, this one too, <laughs> didn't work. So I know I tried this here, try call once. That is also what call once is actually uh, implementing under the hood. If you uh, look into the crate, you will see it. Um, yeah, anyway, that hadn't really worked yet so far. Uh, another slight different is that uh, in the D1, uh, there is a generic defines. We could technically also use a different UART sitting on different pins. So this is, uh, you know, uh, these are the parameters for using a different uh, pin header or something. Uh, we don't really do that here. Uh, we just use this, um, you know, just, just one define zero and that's it. We could actually also do it in the uh, Nerja implementation or for the D1. It doesn't really matter. Uh, because we're just using one UART anyway. Yeah, as, as you can see, that's really it. Uh, everything else is, is really just the same. So yeah, that's what we need to figure out. Um, yeah, I just ran out of ideas last time and I don't think I will uh, find something here during the next minutes. So yeah, let's do uh, a cut here. Let's end the stream for today. Um, and I will see that uh, Next time I have something prepared uh, so that we can actually continue with the implementation here. And then hopefully I can also fully explain it because right now <laughs> I actually can't really. Um, yeah, so until then, uh, thank you very much uh, everyone for joining in. Uh, take care and see you next time.